Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in north central Illinois, about an hour north of Peoria, much farther north than we usually go for an Illinois story. But as we get into this story, I think you'll find that the reason is very clear as to why we're up here. Uh, Kurt Johnson, your collection of Illinois-made rifles and guns is just, just remarkable. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start? Uh, in about 1968. Mm -hmm. uh, started out with... Uh, me seeing a gun that was made very close to home and uh, getting curious about it mm -hmm. and uh, talked to some older collectors that I knew and uh, they said well they'd seen a few too that were made in Illinois uh -huh. so uh, one thing led to another and pretty soon I was going through census <laughs> microfilm looking for see the federal population census lists by occupation from 1850 onward. Oh perfect. And uh, a great source for mm -hmm. uh, original original source yeah. for... But, but you really got the bug, because in the 70s oh, yes. you started doing that research, and then by by uh, by 2005 you had both parts, the part one, volume one, and volume two of your Gun Makers of Illinois book completed, and 20 or 30 years worth of work, I guess, huh? Yes, wore out several <laughs> automobiles, uh, got familiar with just about every courthouse in the state going through mm -hmm. probate records, and... Uh, mm -hmm. Oh golly, census microfilms of old newspapers looking for uh, advertising mm -hmm. becomes, because some did advertise yeah. in the larger it, communities. What intrigued me about visiting you is is that um, not, not only are, do you have this collection and you've written the books, but in the process of doing this you identified a lot of gun makers in central Illinois where most of our viewers are and I think they're going to be surprised to learn how many people were in their communities were making guns and those guns are still hanging around places oh, yes, where, where yes. you can get, get your hands on Yes. Yeah, a lot of the little towns all through central Illinois, as well as the larger cities, yeah. had gun makers. And yes. I asked you to bring some of those guns out for us, and we're going to take a look at those a little later in the program. Mm -hmm. But but as far as the, the, the overall gun making in Illinois, how did it get started? Well, it came along with the population, as you know, with the uh, western migration from the eastern colonies. Uh, a gunsmith, just like a furniture maker or... Mm -hmm. uh, a tinsmith or anything else that supplied things that people local used locally uh, was just part of any community. As the people headed west, those tradesmen went with them. And I guess these guys started out as blacksmiths, didn't they? Would that have been their... No, not really. Huh. Uh, there were a few that were gunsmiths and blacksmiths, especially in the rural areas. But most of them served an apprenticeship as a gunsmith, gunsmith and gunmaker being mm -hmm. an interchangeable term in that period. And uh, usually they'd, for, they'd serve an apprenticeship of from uh, three to seven years, depending on where they apprenticed and mm -hmm. how formal it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and the gunsmiths that came to the Midwest came not only from the Eastern colonies, but from a number of European countries. And those that came from European countries and were trained there served a pretty rigorous uh, apprenticeship mm -hmm. of usually seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, those came from Germany and England and so yeah. on. Well, I, I mentioned earlier that you were going to give us an opportunity to see some of these, these guns that were made in, in the local areas where our viewers live. So let's walk over there and take a look at some of those. You've gotten some out for us, which is really, which is really uh, nice. Let's start with, is, is, aren't these individuals well known? Uh, Robert Bishop at Petersburg was fairly well known. Would you pick that one up for us? Yes. And it's a monster. A uh, 46 inch barrel. Now this is a muzzle loader, right? Yes, okay. yes it is. Can I hold it? Yes, it's quite heavy. I show it to our camera. Oh, it is really heavy. Wow. Okay, and this is, so this is Robert Bishop from, yes. from Petersburg. From Petersburg, and okay. that gun was probably made in the 1840s. That, came, that's going back pretty far. Yeah, he it? came to Petersburg in 1841. Mm -hmm. It was said to have been a uh, personal friend of Abraham Lincoln when nobody knew who Lincoln was. <laughs> In fact, uh, Robert Bishop's first gunsmith shop in Petersburg was moved into Petersburg. It was a small frame building moved into Petersburg on skids from New Salem, uh -huh. and it had been Lincoln's store. Is that right? Yes. 
I'll be darned. Well, he may have made a gun for Lincoln at some point. He could well have, yeah. yes. I'm going to hand this back to you because I don't trust myself with it. And you can uh, you can put it back the way you the way you want to. Okay, so that's that's uh, and he was in a New Salem cabin that had been moved to Petersburg. That's yeah, well, it wasn't cabin. It was a small frame building. The, the building that was it, Lincoln's store. That's yes. amazing. Now, was William Bishop related to him? Because this is a Bishop, Springfield a Springfield gunmaker. Yes, William Bishop was Robert Bishop's brother. Mm -hmm. uh, he came west some years after Robert Bishop. Uh, turns up in uh, Springfield in the 50s and uh, made guns through at least 1868. Uh, this is a, rifles with wood all the way to the muzzle like this, like these two are called full stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that stop right here are called half stocks. Okay, and this is also a Springfield gun maker. Yes. And who's this fellow? Uh, this was John J. Freitas. Uh, the name was originally Defreitas. He was uh, Illinois' only Portuguese-born gunsmith. Uh, in the 1840s, there was uh, quite a number of uh, Portuguese that settled in the Jacksonville, Springfield area. They had uh, fled Madeira due to religious persecution. They were mm -hmm. Protestant, and uh, the. Uh, Illinois College in Jacksonville being a Presbyterian school, and they were Presbyterian, mm -hmm. uh, settled a lot of them in that area. I see. But only one of them was a gun maker. That's all we know of, yes. I'll be dark. Here's another, can I pick this one up too? Yes. Okay, I'm going to be careful not to aim no, it. No, that's the a very, man. very early Springfield you maker. Okay, that's, this is. That's John Craddock, okay. Springfield. Uh, turns up in Springfield in, I believe, 1838. Made guns through uh, at least 1851. That is old. That's just about, of course, you have an older one, and we're going to see that, but you don't have a lot older ones in Central Illinois. No, no, this is, this is pretty early, and this is large caliber. This was made for big game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, about 55, 56 caliber. Mm -hmm. Big game would have been deer. Uh, well, unless you went west. Mm -hmm. Elk and, and bear. Huh? Yeah, and, you know, a lot of people did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I might also point out that that Bishop rifle is also about that same caliber. It's very, okay, and that's very the large. We're looking at right here. Yeah. Yeah. And what caliber would that have been? Say? It's uh, 54 to 56. Mm -hmm. I can't give you an exact measurement mm -hmm. without. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. These are all everything that you have set out here. This is uh, this is from Virginia, Cass County. Um, well, also Pena. Pena, right? He worked in several different locations. He sure did. His see. name was William Tetley. Yes. Came from Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah, that's a smaller, but a really pretty gun. Yeah, it's uh, it's very nicely made. A lot of that's inlay. A, yeah. Now, did they did most of the gun makers use use that inlay like that? It was mostly up to the customer. These guns were made to order for a customer. Oh, they were. Okay. And I think some gunsmiths kind of pushed that a little more than others. It looks like here he's got a quite maybe a quail, some kind of well, it's yes, upside it, down. It, it would appear to be a quail. Mm hmm Isn't that interesting? And uh, his signature on top of the barrel. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can pick that up or let's, not. Let's do see if we can see the signature. Oh yeah. Okay. There it says Tetley right there. Mm hmm and they would stamp that in there. Was that routine to stamp the signature in there? Uh, some were stamped and some were script engraved. Mm -hmm. uh, each maker had his own mm -hmm. way of doing things. Here's a, here's a, a maker from uh, Marcus Barrett from oh. Assumption. Yeah, you'll have to turn yeah, it there. Turn it. Okay. In uh, also Christian County, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, Christian County. Yes. Um, this is a little more ornate. That is about as fancy as Illinois guns get. Look at all the look at all the work, the uh, metal work on that. Wow. Le Eleven piercings in the patch box. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the inlays are sterling silver. A oh silver goodness. wire inlay up here on the wrist. Oh wow! Yeah. And now, did, did you say the gun makers did not make the locks in most cases? In in most cases, they bought the locks from those who specialized in just making locks, mm -hmm. mostly back east. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just more expedient. There are exceptions to that, of course. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and his signature is in a silver inlay. Let me see if I can turn it around so we can see it right side up. Excuse me. Yeah, there you get a good look at it. M. L. Is that M. L. Barrett? I guess mm -hmm. is what it is. Yes. Huh? Yeah. Very fancy. I bet when you come across one of these, do you do you just get thrilled? To, oh yes. Do, is it a gun show, or how do you usually find these? Uh, each one has its own story. Is that right? They've come from here, there, and everywhere. 
Uh, Are some, they still turning up? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, as fast as I can afford them anyway. <laughs> it's a money pit, isn't it? Oh, yes. <laughs> 250 of them, though. Wow, let's see, maybe you can help me. Yeah. Is that right? There you go. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Well, listen, let's take a little break, and we're going to talk a little more about, uh, about this industry, uh, what happened when the Civil War occurred, and what that did to the industry, and those kinds of things. Okay? Okay. Kurt, you ask a gun collector to, to uh, show his favorite gun, and it's kind of like asking you to choose between your children, isn't it? It's exactly. kind of hard to, yes. it's hard to pick one, isn't it? <laughs> yes, very much so. <laughs> we looked at one that from Spring, made in Springfield that was uh, one of your favorites. Assumption, actually. Yeah, the, Assumption was one of your favorites. Marcus Elbera. But So you had a hard choice to make, but I did ask you, and you came up with another one that you really, really like. Yes. Would you show that one to us? Yes, this is a rifle <laughs> made in Henry, Illinois, right along the Illinois River, north of Peoria by a gun maker named Edward Klein, uh, stocked in tiger striped maple and... Uh, oh, the maple's beautiful, isn't it? Profusely inlaid with silver mm -hmm. and uh, hand-forged iron trigger guard made by Klein. So he made this to fit, to fit his hand? Well, he made it to fit someone's gloved hand, probably made to a customer's uh, order. Oh, but okay. Normally they'd use a uh, sand casting but this, this one is made, is hand forged. Oh, okay. And he uses real silver in his inlay, right? Uh, no, this one is this one is German silver, which is uh, an alloy of nickel. Uh, the Barrett rifle, however, is that, that one is sterling. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. And what what year does this date back to? Oh, it would go uh, somewhere between 1854 and about 1870. Mm -hmm. It'd be, it mm -hmm. would be hard to pin it down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me put that down while you reach the oldest one that's in your collection. Okay. This is a rifle made by Thomas Hunt in Timber Township, Peoria County, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And it's signed on top of the barrel in a silver inlay. T. Hunt, February 21st, 1833. 1833. Wow. Now, it's unusual for this gun to be percussion in 1833. Most were flintlocks mm -hmm. in that period. He was uh, sort of on the cutting edge of technology. Mm -hmm. so it's, had some, it's had some rough usage it's over had the a years, lot of use, hasn't it? Yes. And this would, you said this would normally have been a full stock. Yes. Which would have, been, would, would have gone all the way down the barrel. Right. And it's been modified. It was cut down to a half stock at mm -hmm. some point. And why and, would they have done that? Uh, either because they wanted you know, they thought they liked the style better in later years, or because there was wood damage out here, and mm -hmm. they just did that to, mm -hmm. to correct it. Yeah. Now, in this era, everything was shooting around ball. Is that right? Well, uh, yes, pretty much. Uh, the, the picket bullets and other types of cylindrical conoidal bullets and so on yeah. came a bit later. Can, can we take a look at those so people understand what yes. we're talking about? Um, you've got set out some examples for us here. And when I said the round ball, this is what most muzzle loaders of the time were shooting, right? Just right. a regular. Yes, a round ball. Yeah. Of, of and, and the trouble with the ball was, I mean, since it was round, it was given to the vagaries of the air, and it would drop, and exactly. it didn't really form a tight well, path. Within it? about 150 yards, a round ball is deadly accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, it starts to lose it. It takes a longer projectile to... Uh, to do the long range yeah. shooting. And, and these pointed ones that we pointed out there, you call these picket? Those are picket bullets, Picket yes. bullets. Mm -hmm. Would you show us a, a gun that, that takes that? Yes, here is a Brunker and Bushick rifle made in Ottawa, target rifle. You'll notice it has an odd little, little thing here on the front of it. Yeah. And that the muzzle is turned around, although the barrel is octagon. Oh, that's is, how you tell, because it becomes round at the end. The muzzle is turned around to mm -hmm. facilitate the use of a guide bullet starter. That's what this is. Okay. And the end of this and would plunger. Would you show us how? Would, is, this, is it this one? The, yeah. Okay, that would, would you work, show us yeah. how that would work? The end of this plunger is uh, shaped to fit the point mm -hmm. of the picket bullet and started in the bore. Mm hmm. Started in the bore with, so with the starter, far, mm -hmm. and then it can be pushed on down with the ramrod without tipping. I see. Okay, and that's more accurate for longer distances. Oh yes, yeah. They they shot these guns at forty rods, eighty rods. Is, is, is the end of this rifled, and that's does it the, get the, that thing spinning? Yeah, the entire bore is rifled. Oh, the important the entire bore. Okay. Yeah. Now Brocker's rifles are normally uh, cut with what was called gain twist, 
it would start out at a slow twist at the bridge and accelerate toward mm -hmm. the muzzle. Mm -hmm. Now we mentioned Brucker, and I'm looking at a, a large display. You've you've got you're quite a Brunker collector. Well, it's <laughs> look at everything on that wall is Brunker. He was it? quite a prolific maker. Yeah, yeah, and, and tell us about him. Well, he came from upstate New York uh, to Ottawa in 1848, and. Had quite a quite a large shop. He employed uh, oh, anywhere from four to six men in his shop. Most mm -hmm. of these gunsmiths worked alone, mm -hmm. but he always had an apprentice or two and a couple of journeymen working in his shop. Sometimes a partner. Uh -huh. uh, excellent gunsmith. Made was noted for long range target rifles. Uh, shot a lot of target matches himself and had quite a reputation mm -hmm. as a shooter. What, what, he was making a, a good living making guns. Oh, a yes. lot of these guys probably yes. made them on the side, but he was making a good well, living. Well, the majority of them did it as the ones that you, you know, that you can readily document did it as a full-time mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. uh, some combined it with another trade, but he didn't. He, uh, he had enough. Yeah. He was in good location yeah. and he had enough yeah. business that that wasn't necessary. We were talking about the accuracy of, of the mm -hmm. round ball, and I asked you also to pull one out that would be a good example of, of, of a big game, one used for big game at that time, and you've actually been able to use this one. Yes, you? this one, I killed an Illinois whitetail with this one several years ago. Uh, this is a rifle made by Rudolph Pelk in Freeport, Illinois. It's 58 caliber and it's what would be called a plains rifle. Mm -hmm. Uh, made to go west for large game, buffalo, mm -hmm. bear, whatever was. Mm -hmm. uh, or white-tailed deer. Or white-tailed deer. <laughs> I'll bet that was a thrill, wasn't it? Yes, you're, it was. You're, uh, I think old Rudolph would have and... been proud. Yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. Okay, we still have some time to talk about the Civil War and how mm -hmm. that changed this industry because everything we've been looking at, or mostly everything we've been looking at here is pre-Civil War. And, and during the Civil War and after then, these big gun manufacturers started to really make a lot of guns because they were needed, right? Yes. So your, your, your guy down the street that was making a gun per order, I mean, that really affected his business. It affected his business, not immediately, but over time, uh, as the major manufacturers began to uh, churn out guns for the civilian trade after mm -hmm. the war, uh, it began to cut into their business. Uh, to where a lot of them became just repairmen rather than uh, making guns primarily. Mm -hmm. But there were still some that were uh, were making guns much later than most people suppose. Mm -hmm. There were still a lot of gun makers producing uh, a number of rifles in the 1870s and, and even 1880s. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was working on my books, I uh, was researching a gun maker at Olney, Illinois named Henry Godak. And uh, his guns are, are fairly common. And he didn't open his shop until 1873. So uh, we're talking mm -hmm. quite, quite a while after mm -hmm. the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And he had two sons uh, that were born late in his life that were still living when I was researching my book. Oh, good. And uh, I had the opportunity to interview one of them. And he told me that he remembered as a boy, and this would have been in about 1903, that his dad was still making a few muzzle loaders for local diehards who wanted them after the turn of the century. Uh -huh. uh, he said he remembers watching rifle barrels. So uh, mm -hmm. it did hang, it did hang on a lot later yeah. in some areas, especially. Maybe you'll stumble onto one of those. Oh, I have one. Oh, you have. <laughs> yeah. Of course you do. Yeah, there's a Henry Godek <laughs> rifle right up there. <laughs> Kurt, I had no idea how many gun makers lived in central Illinois. Yes, uh, the central part of the state had a lot of them, especially in little towns, and uh, they were along the rivers. Uh, mm -hmm. This group right here, the uh, starting with the one on the, with the star on the buttstock, mm -hmm. uh, is a Robert Bishop rifle made in Petersburg, then a T-Pit rifle, which was made in Southport, Peoria County. Uh, the next one would be a, a William Parker rifle made in Mason City, Mason County. Uh -huh. uh, then we have a rifle by John Daniel at Sedora, Mason County. The next one is a John Trexler rifle made in Latona, which is in, uh, I believe, uh, Jasper County. The run one with the, all the inlays is a rifle by uh, Jacob Beck in Hillsborough, Montgomery County. Mm. 
Then we have a, a William Bishop rifle made in Springfield, mm -hmm. a Samuel Matlin rifle made in Springfield, a C.H. Smith rifle made in Springfield, wow. uh, then a, a William Rue rifle made in Peoria, another William Rue rifle made in Peoria, an OPC Corps rifle made in Peoria. This one is a uh, John Schultheis rifle made in Pekin, a Jake Ramey rifle made in Bloomington, a, uh, got to stop and think on this one, this is a Champaign County maker, uh, mm -hmm. Burgess, Jonathan Burgess, and the bottom one is an F.W. Muller rifle made in Peoria. Mm -hmm. Wow. And over here, we've got another look at some exquisite pieces from Springfield. Step over here if you would for me, Kurt. Yeah, these are these are just really, really ornate, aren't they? Yes, these uh, these were made. These bottom two were made by L. G. Ward in Springfield, mm -hmm. 1850s. In fact, this one is dated 1854. Uh, the engraving and inlay work on them is uh, quite they outstanding. They were works of art as much as they were industry. I'll tell you. This one is worth. Oh, just beautiful. A second look. It sure is. Uh, has the original owner's name and laid or engraved on that inlay. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite an extraordinary it gun. Really is. And the next one down here, I'll replace that for you. The next one down is the only one you have from Decatur. Is that right? This shotgun right here. Yeah. Yes. Would you hold that up for us? Yes, I will. Maybe you want to help me put that back yeah. down there. There we go. Be very careful. Okay. Yeah. This is uh, a Decatur. Piece, yes, this it? is a Korsmeyer and O'Neill shotgun, breech, or very early breech-loading shotgun made in Decatur. Breaks open to load, used uh, brass shotgun shells. And uh, he wasn't the most prominent, their Korsmeyer and O'Neill were not the most prominent Decatur makers, uh, Hieronymus Mueller was, but mm -hmm. uh, this would have been one of his competitors. Hieronymus Mueller was a famous industrialist for making other things, but he was a great gun maker as well. Um, and these, now we have three from Quincy. Yes, this is a percussion muzzle loading shotgun by Franz Tobias in Quincy. He came here from Hungary in about 1850. Uh, was a, seemed to have made only shotguns. They're quite high quality. Mm -hmm. And unlike most shotgun makers uh, who used imported barrels, it appears that Tobias made his own. Mm -hmm. Now, he also came over into the breech loading era and made this breech loading shotgun. Also, FR Tobias and Quincy, it has uh, quite a lot of nice engraving on it. Yes, it does. And his name in gold on the rib. We'll have to talk firing to Tobias and have him, have him work on there. Holding it from going shut. Uh, here we have a rifle made by John Wesley Shaw in Quincy, Illinois, mm -hmm. probably 1840s. Beautiful. Uh, he was uh, one of twin sons of, of John Shaw Sr., who was also a gunsmith, also in Quincy. Uh, John Shaw came to Quincy in, in about 1841, and uh, his two sons, as I mentioned, both became gunsmiths, John W. Shaw and Alonzo E. Shaw, and both of them went on across the river into Iowa in later years, mm -hmm. made guns in Keokuk. I want to thank you for this visit. This has been terrific. Well, I think it's an eye-opener for, for everybody, especially people from Illinois. Thanks, Kurt. Well, thank you for your interest. You're, you're very welcome. Kurt Johnson does presentations for historical societies and other groups that are interested. In fact, he has an upcoming one for the Macon County Conservation District in Decatur on July 21st. With another Illinois story in North Central Illinois, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you.
For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.